What do we need in our next mayor? Toronto's got a really great election coming up. That's very important. We're here with Deputy Mayor Jennifer McKelvey, Councillor for Scarborough Rouge Park. I'm going to turn it over to her to get her thoughts. Thank you so much for having me here in this amazing venue with tea. A great way to start the morning. Absolutely. Uh, I am unexpectedly in this role as the head of the city and have been since February 17th. And it's been a real, real privilege to serve the residents of Toronto in this capacity. Albeit unexpected, I was elected as the councillor for Scarborough Rouge Park. Uh, but now, you know, I have the opportunity to meet residents across the city and I have really, really enjoyed uh, talking to them, hearing from them and, and working for them. Um, so as for what we need in our next mayor, you want me to get into that right now? Do it, do, do it. it. Okay, <laughs> well, the there's a few things I've learned about this rule. And the first is that you have incredible convening power. And through that, I think what we need in our next mayor is somebody that has that ability to both convene people, but also find consensus to move things forward. And they're doing that with a real lack of power, so to speak. So uh, as mayor of the city of Toronto, you're very limited compared to at the provincial or at the federal levels. So they're very bound by very strict, um, strict rules on what they can do. For example, you can't direct police. So you could have a round table and you could identify community safety initiatives, but you can't direct police to do that. Um, you can uh, you can host the tables for them to identify what they need and they can come back and ask you, um, but ultimately that's their decision. And the other is about finances. And that's something I'm sure we'll delve much, much deeper into yeah. is the financial crisis that we do have in the city of Toronto. And again, the mayor is very limited in how they can turn that around. So what do we need in the next mayor? We need somebody that has the ability to convene people, to find consensus, to solve complex problems. We need somebody that can build relationships with other orders of government to get things done. And also we need somebody that has real vision and a love for the city. That's awesome. And I think that all of that is so important. And it is a question that I've asked everybody about, hey, Toronto, what's the good, what's the bad, what's the ugly? And everybody has shared their ideas. They all offer something different. Um, and what you say is so poignant because you're actually there, you know, and, and you know, and you see it firsthand. Um, I just wanted to kind of go back a little bit about, you know, when you were a counselor and now you are, are the mayor, what do you, what have you felt personally, like in terms of your day-to-day -day schedule, has that changed, you know? What is your life like? Well, I get up earlier than I ever used to. That has been the biggest adjustment. Okay. I think as a counselor, I always worked long nights. We had, we'd have events in the evenings, but I definitely get into work much earlier than ever before. Uh, but I will say that when it was official at you know 5 p.m. on February 17th, um, I said to all of the wonderful staff in the mayor's office, you know, take it was a long weekend, take the weekend off. We will meet at 9 a.m. on Tuesday. And I was a little scared walking into City Hall, hoping, you know, what if people aren't here? What if they don't want to stay and, and yeah, work with me? And uh, everybody showed up. Everybody was professional. Everybody rolled up their sleeves and got to work. And and it's a shared love of the city uh, that they share in the in the mayor's office. So uh, and that is going to be a big, big first step for the new mayor is to build that team and to build that team to execute what their vision is for the city of Toronto. Um, other things that have changed, I I was very focused as a counselor on what I call my three things. Yeah. And my three things were Scarborough Transit, the ravine strategy for the city, and improving the trail connections and climate action. Yeah. I still work on those, but 
I had my first meeting with the police chief shortly after transitioning to the role of uh, deputy mayor as the head of the city. And so it's been a transition for me to learn more about all of these files and very, very important work that needs to happen around community safety in the city of Toronto. Yeah. And I mean, the, you know, you have been such an ardent, like, you know, representative of your community. And it's really great that we had someone so able to step up and and, and just fill that role. And that is something which, you know, hard work being committed community member, but it's also opened up like all of these other, you know, aspects that you've just mentioned. Um, a few of the, con- I want to take the conversation to some of the conversations, the p- the key pieces that I've been speaking with many of the candidates, which is public transit and safety, uh, affordable h- housing has come up. People have, we've talked about Ontario Science Center and, and um, you know, relocating it to Ontario Place, as well as we've also talked about um, super mayor powers. So for many people, they're like, oh, they hear about it and they're like, oh, okay. And, and people have these ideas of we're going to build more, we're going to do this or we're, you know, but the nuts and bolts of it, which you just kind of inferred, right, about finances, like we're in a dark, I know that our, the coffers are empty, right? And we need to do more and it's going to take hard work from everyone. So it's not like a magical wand. Everything's going to be good. Once we get a new mayor, there's a lot of hard work. So of those, any of those topics, which would you like to start with? Well, let's, let's talk with the the big one, the fiscal yeah. framework needed for the city of Toronto. And then I'm happy to, to yeah. delve down into the others. I, uh, we have a financial crisis in the city of Toronto uh, with our books right now. So when uh, I unexpectedly became the head of the city, I actually looked up what is what is the job of the mail? What is the technical descriptor, right? And it's the CEO of the corporation. So when you look at it as a corporation, you say, wow, 42,000 employees, $16 billion budget with a $1.5 billion hole. That's not good. That's a big, big challenge. And that is a challenge that the next mayor will have to uh, really keep top of mind as they make all election promises and as they go forward. So how do we get out of that hole? Um, there's a few things. So firstly, in July, we do have a report that's coming back on the revenue tools that are available okay. to us right now legislatively. And those will include things like, for example, vehicle registration tax. But the provincial government took that away, so that's not easy for the city to implement. So we have to, one, not just look at the tools that are available, but how easily implementable they are, and what is the actual revenue they can generate? Because I don't think any single one of them adds up to $1.5 billion. So then you have to say, okay, well, what revenue tools can we build? And then it is very, very much going to be the relationship building with the province and with the federal government. And Toronto is the economic engine of Canada. We know that a strong Toronto means a strong Canada. And we, as that economic engine, generate huge amounts of income for the provincial and the federal governments. We need to make sure that we're getting our fair share of that into the city of Toronto. What does that look like? That's the important conversation that has to be had. Is it a percentage point of the sales tax? Maybe. Is it a percentage point of a business income tax or a residential income tax? Mm -hmm. That is, uh, those are the important conversations that are going to have to be made so that we can figure out this problem. This problem arose because of the pandemic. And throughout the pandemic, we have seen that ridership has dropped. And we are operating now 91% of pre-pandemic service for 69% of the ridership. We are so dependent on the fare box. We don't have that money coming in to fund TTC. So this year alone, um, we are looking at about $366 million. And uh, sorry, 360, 366 or 317, because the other one is shelter costs, which I often yeah. mix up to. Shelter mm-hmm. costs, same thing. We expanded our shelter system by 3,000 throughout the pandemic. Yeah. And we want to operate these shelters. We want to take care of our most vulnerable populations. We need other level of government to help that. So that's the finance piece. I'm happy to talk about any of the other issues as well, if you'd like. No, that's really important because I think that provides a foundation. Like, what's the real deal, right? Like, I've had these conversations with mayors. They all have their visions. They all have their, you know, three-point platform or something like that. But physically, how are we going to make it happen? Um, The fare box, you know, as you had mentioned, operating at 91%, 69% of ridership, but people are also, I think that number is dropping because of people not feeling safe. Yeah. 
you know, people have said, oh, and I'm like, okay, when that issue has come, topic has come up, many mayors have said, well, we need to have more police presence or we need to have wraparound services. I think the, the real issue is how easy is it to implement and just putting more cops there you're also, you're reassigning them. Like, it's not like new cops have yeah. shown up. You have to, where you add, you have to take. Right. So where are you taking away from? Yeah. Right. And so I don't, those are the questions that kind of go through my mind. And what do you think when people talk about that? So when I talked about convening power, um, that is a great example. So we have been convening meetings with City of Toronto employees uh, from SafeTO and Shelter Services okay. alongside employees with TTC and Toronto Police. So we have these working meetings where we are saying, how can we continue to improve safety on the TTC? And the numbers are moving in the right direction. Things are working. Okay. So here's what we have underway right now. Through the budget, we added 50 security guards for TTC. We added streets to homes workers, and we added the MDOT teams, multidisciplinary multi outreach teams okay. that go out and help with mental health calls. So okay. we have now started to see that we are rolling out all these additional workers in the TTC and it is starting to help. It is moving in the right direction. Uh, police continue to come to that table and what they had done is they added the extra officers that were in there. Um, they pulled them back on a regular patrol, but they continue to have a presence okay. in the TTC on a regular basis. And uh, they have committed to continue to do that for as long as needed. So we are looking at the data. We are looking, things are trending in the right direction. Yeah. That data is what needs to be used to inform next steps. Yeah. And certainly will that data will need to be used to inform what needs to be done through the 2024 budget process. In terms of policing, uh, they need to make the request to us for what they think they need. And then city council will have to make a decision about whether to resource and fund that. Right. And when the budget, when the fiscal framework is one that's very thin and you're in a deficit, and I think under the City of Toronto Act, we're not allowed to be in a deficit, right? We have to balance the books. Yes. So I, I'm, I'm like processing that. Like, oh, it's not like federal. It's not like provincial. As this, under the City of Toronto Act, you cannot have a deficit. So where are we going to get those funds? And $1.6 billion is not a small number. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also like the street, so with regards to the streets to home um, piece, how does that, like, it's not necessarily direct, right? Like how does, what would they be doing? So the streets to home workers have started to have a bigger presence in the TTC and okay. they will find in vulnerable individuals that are sleeping in the okay. TTC and they are transitioning them into the shelter system. And it's had great success. We'll be releasing the numbers this week. And uh, we are finding that, you know, residents are, are, um, are vulnerable residents of Toronto that are in the transit system are starting to move into shelters yeah. and uh, moving out. And it, and we're realizing that this is not somewhere for loitering. You do need to move along. Yeah. Um, and they've been very uh, understanding, accommodating of that and moving into the shelter system. So we're trying to continue that. Yeah. Um, and, and it's the same thing with, uh, with you know, all the different problems that we're having on the TTC, right? Uh, we need to be saying, you know, this isn't somewhere for loitering. This isn't somewhere for yeah. doing drugs. You need to move along and make sure that people are getting the resources and the help that they need. Yeah. And I don't know if this is like accurate or true, but you know, the, I think one of the reasons why we are where we are with having vulnerable people and homeless people on the TTC services was during the pandemic, when everybody was at home, Shelters were, I mean, obviously we had investment in shelters, but lots of people said, I don't feel safe in shelters. Where was a safe place to go that was warm and enclosed? TTC, right? And when there was a huge drop in ridership, people like you would have um, people come on and ride it. And so what we're dealing with is sort of the tail end of the systemic issue of COVID. And I don't always know if people have kind of processed, like this is an increased surge in violence because of these things. It's just what were the systems that were in place that people were utilizing or not utilizing and as a ripple effect that's the reason why we're dealing with this and so with the streets to home program having more people say hey we've got a shelter system but it takes me to my next question funding is is like covid funding is being pulled and so the number of beds the you know top ups to help people is being reduced what does this mean where do they go then 
So we have many different things happening around housing in the city of Toronto. Yeah. So there is the shelter system, which has added 3,000 beds in the last several years throughout the pandemic. There's also supportive housing. So, and we are building, continuing to build supportive housing every year over year. I believe we're adding another thousand plus this year. Yeah. So that takes pressure off shelters because you move people yeah. from the shelters into supportive housing where they have the wraparound supports that they need. In addition to that, we have very ambitious housing plans in the city of Toronto right now. We just made our housing pledge of 285,000 new homes over the next 10 years. Okay. And that will be accommodated by several different things. So one is relaxing the uh, criteria that we have right now around uh, how homes are used. So in December, we approved multi-tenant homes and bringing in legalization and licensing of multi-tenant homes. And that is really important because people were living that way anyway mm -hmm. without the safety measures that are needed and without the fire protection, uh, without all the things that make sure that they're safe in those homes. So that is being rolled out. This month, we're also rolling out multiplexes, which allows you to have four, up to four small apartments in your your house, house for example. Yeah, like you can break it up. Like, yeah. like Toronto is known for its classic duplex, triplex, right. right? And I'm a realtor, and so I often say the best value that you can get in Toronto is probably a duplex or triplex uh, compared to a brand new condo, which is also not rent, like rent controlled in any way. Um, so that's really great because there were limitations right. with how many you could have. Yes. Right? And there's still limitations on how many you can have, but more importantly, we're expanding it across the city because right now it's only been in certain zones. So right. it's making it more consistent across the entire city. So that's on the, so we moving up the spectrum, you have shelters, supportive housing, multi-tenant, multiplex. Now you're getting into affordable housing. At the city, we are opening up some of our land uh, to developers so that they can develop affordable housing on those sites. And uh, that would be affordable rental. But we're also just making it easier in general to build in the city of Toronto. Okay. And that is important. So we are creating uh, new teams to look at the permits and the zoning that are needed okay. so that when your project comes in, it has a single team that has all the experts needed. So no paths are getting crossed. Everybody's talking to everybody and you can get through the approval system faster. That's and the faster, important. right, That's the faster so you get through because while you're waiting to build on your property in a year, if it's taking you a year to get through the system, the escalations have gone up, inflation yes, has gone up, yes. labor supplies are a problem, uh, you know, pro procurement's a problem, everything is a problem. So the faster you get your permissions, the faster you start building, the lower the cost, the lower the cost to build, the lower the cost for the resident that is buying it. So it is a spectrum of what we're doing. It is about building at all ends of the spectrum. The one I think we still have a lot more to do is on the seniors housing. Yes, If we build so more seniors housing, we get people out of their single family homes. So so you have yes. somebody living in a very, very large home. They can downsize into seniors housing. That makes it open for a family. So I think that's still one piece that we need to do a little bit more work on. Um, I mean, that that's music to my heart because it is something that I see. Like, what, a month or two ago, there was the article that came out about the um, a senior woman who was on OAS and couldn't find affordable housing and kept having to downsize as she was, you know, the landlord was reclaiming the space or something like that and she's now living in you know one particular one woman was like living in a basement that was like 300 square feet right? right and i just was like oh what can we do about it and it's just so great to hear that we a have pilot programs to help support that but that there's also a recognition we need to do more the question is time is the enemy in so many ways because people need housing now right right and so I love the idea of opening up prop land so that we can build up. I love the idea that with the existing um, housing supply that we can find ways to, uh, you know, increase the number of people. So multi-tenanted, I just wanted to clarify, is like having more than one, like renting out rooms Correct. in a place. So I just wanted to clarify that that's what a multi-tenanted home is, that yeah. you can have like different rooms that you share, which... Correct. So each tenant has their own room, but then there's shared spaces. So there may be shared washrooms or there may yeah. be shared kitchens, whereas a multiplex means it's a mini apartment. So yeah. you have everything contained within your unit itself. Yeah. No, thank you. I mean, this is it's this is so helpful because 
things take time and you need to bring people together. You need to convene support from different counselors from different organizations and partnerships to help move it forward. But it sounds like so much of what you're saying, the city has been active on these things and saying we need to reduce these things. So I think about what people are saying. I always ask them like, how are we gonna do that? Right? And it sounds like there are a lot of things in place to help that. Um, okay, how about moving the Science Center? So I think we have to start with the premise that both the Science Center and the Ontario Place are significantly in need of investment. Yes. So I think we have to start with the agreement on that. I think a lot of us have nostalgia about these places. They are not the nostalgic places they were when we were kids. And I think they both need to have updating. We have a government that wants to spend money to update them. That is a good thing. So where do we go from here? I think we all need to take a step back to have some visioning exercises together to work collaboratively, to look at what the future could be of, in particular, the Ontario Science Center site, because there hasn't been a lot of discussion around that. I think we need to say, what is it we love about the site? I think a lot of people love the building. Uh, yeah. They love that it has employment. Uh, they love that it's in the science and tech space. So is there something around that? How can we repurpose this building? How can we use this building? What should that vision be? I think right now we've gone out to residents and not we, the government, the provincial government went out to say, hey, we want to move to the Science Centre, but they never really told the community what could that vision be for that right. space. And we haven't had that conversation. And it is an important conversation to have with the local residents. Yeah. What do they want to see in their community? So I think we can all get there together. Yeah. I think we have to uh, first... First, all agree, what do we agree upon? I think we agree investments needed on both sides. Yeah, that's true. Where are we disagreeing? Still, it's the vision on what could be there, right? And should it move or should it be in, uh, should it be enhanced? Um, but I think that conversation has to be done with everybody at the table. And I think there is a willingness for that to happen. And it just needs to be operationalized. No, and I think that's a, a really good way to present it, like consultations, all those things. So I think that's really helpful because people have been like, oh, well, what about the triple sphere of the fact that you have the Aga Khan Museum, you have, you know, the Japanese Culture Center and, and all of those things. But consultation is important, right? Um, yeah, like, I mean, I this is all so helpful just in terms of framing like, hey, these are things that people should think about, right? And also the convening powers. That's something that you mentioned that's really important because... If you're one person, and that's what the role has been as mayor, you sit with all of these, your counselors, which is now 25, your vote is the same as that. Yeah. So how does the super mayor powers impact? Like, what is that? Like, I think people hear about it and they're like, super mayor powers, what is that? So the mayor, even under superpowers, still has one vote. So, um, okay. but what they could do is say that this is an area of provincial uh, significance, a provincial priority related to transit or housing. And then they could say, I'm going to invoke my super mayor powers. Um, kind of sounds like a superhero there. It's yeah, not yeah, like yeah. you're changing your super suit. Um, I'm going to invoke my super mayor powers. And in that case, you need uh, a, a vote of a third to get something through. A vote of a third to mm -hmm. get something through council. Um, that has never been used. So uh, Mayor Tory never used that. Uh, it was a power that was granted, I think, late last year. Has never been used. That's That's one. The other is, which was granted last spring, is around budget and around the hiring of city officials. And so this is one that uh, certainly I think the new mayor uh, will use. And so for budget, uh, how it worked previously was, I'm gonna get really in the weeds here. Do it, so, okay. do it, I love right. it, Bring So how it, it worked previously was bureaucracy would propose a budget and then that budget would go through the budget committee um, line by line and they would make a recommendation and then it would go to the executive committee where the mayor could have input and start making changes. And then from there, it went to council for a vote. This is really flipping it where it's kind of coming through the executive first, so to speak, because the mayor is having his input. He is incorporating his input into that budget in advance. These are her. His or her. Yeah, good point. Good point. <laughs> very, 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 very good point. Um, so, and again, I'm just going with the framework yeah, of the yeah, last, of our, of our uh, last mayor. And yeah, the mayor yeah. before that. And the mayor before yeah. that. So, yeah, very good point. Uh, so, the mayor will go through the mayor's executive 
first. Yeah. And uh, in the, through the mayor's, uh, we'll have his feedback incorporated into yeah. it. And that's important for a few reasons. Firstly, if they make promises around what the tax rate should be, then the whole budget, budget can be built around that tax rate. Okay. Or um, if they have certain priorities that they want to make sure they campaigned on and that she has incorporated into yeah. at the early stage. So that that can happen. So there there is flexibility on how it gets rooted after the mayor proposes it. Yeah. Uh, our previous mayor, uh, Mayor Tory, still had it go through budget committee and then yeah. on to council. I think that's a good idea. I hope the next mayor still does that and it has that public consultation stage. Yeah. Um, and I think that's very important. So that's more the the budget. And it makes sense because I think most Toronto residents think the mayor has that kind of influence yes. on the budget yeah. anyway. Yeah. Uh, so that makes sense. And then the hiring of top city officials. Um, prior to this, they would go through uh, a hiring panel, city council, um, but the mayor didn't really have the ability to say, I also want a new position in X and hire right. for that. So if they, if affordable housing and there was a certain thing around affordable housing they wanted, now what they can do is they can hire a person and their job is to deliver on that task they've been right. assigned. Yeah. So that's something that's new. And I also think you'll see the new mayor, he or she, uh, use that. I think that's really powerful, right? Because when we hear about everybody's vision and all of those platform pieces, these are cr critical tools in which they can enact or enable that vision to come through. And so I think a few things that you, I wanted to do a recap on, the mayor is not able to direct the police on how to do anything. So when we talk about transit safety or safety and public safety in general, that's a consultation, right? Like they have, you had mentioned the board, that the mayor can convene a board of different leaders from different organizations covering the different sectors of health, social work, or, you know, all of those components. And then they can put forth a recommendation to the police. And is that how they exert? They can influence? put a request. Yeah, they can put a request or a suggestion, but they cannot direct. And I think that is important. And I understand why that was developed um, because the police are looking at the whole city holistically all safety issues holistically. And so they need to be able to look at their resourcing across the city and make sure that it's being designated in the right way. And so while we have an issue, particular issue here or there, like we can't forget all those other issues that they're dealing yeah. with, right? So I think it's important that uh, they have that ability to look holistically against, uh, uh, holistically about safety in the city and then make those those decisions and implement them. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that because that's so critical. Like people are like, well, we need more of this. Where does that come from? It is a holistic process. Um, the other piece I wanted to ask about, like long, we talked about seniors, like and, and seniors like uh, housing and that sort of thing, even long-term health care. During the pandemic, you know, a study did come through that said the not-for-profit seniors homes we're actually providing better care than the private sector. Okay, that aside, that's one thing. However, what we're also seeing is seniors homes being, private sector seniors homes being sold. And so as our, we have an aging population with more people who need those services, we're also seeing a bit of a decline of spaces mm -hmm. for that. And what are your thoughts in terms of how we could address that? Like, you know, someone had mentioned about like, well, we, we could, we should be buying those properties. And I know, I know of an instance where there was a senior's home that was sold and privately to a developer. How does the city compete with that? So that's a very tough topic because I think one thing we have to be very careful at at the city is taking on the responsibilities of other levels of government. And healthcare is a provincial responsibility. Yeah. And we plug the holes and we fill the gaps yeah. at the city because it's the right thing to do. Um, but we have to be careful about doing that because then there's an expectation on us to continue to do that. And with the financial problems we're seeing right now, one of the things we're going to have to have as this conversation is looking at what is it that we're delivering that we should not be delivering that actually should be done by the other levels of government. So I absolutely feel that uh, long-term care is a provincial responsibility. 
We do have some that are operated by the city of Toronto, and I'm not saying that we need to walk from, away yeah, from those, yeah. but I think we have to keep we have to keep enormous pressure on the provincial government to step up around uh, long term care. There are proposals that are coming in, so when they come in for redevelopment. I think at the city, one of our jobs is to make sure those permits and those approvals get pushed through as quickly right. as possible to help with the cost escalations. Because again, we, the longer it takes, the more stuff costs. Totally. So can we process these faster? We do have um, a stream for those right now to make sure they get preferential treatment to get pushed through um, faster. So we need to continue to keep doing all of that. Um, but I don't know that we want to see our city starting to buy the homes and continue to take on those operations unless we have a, a dedicated funding source from the province that is guaranteed, uh, then that's a very different story. Yeah, no, and I think that's that's very right on point. Uh, it made me, actually, when you were talking, it made me think about how the province or multiple levels of government have downloaded things right. to the city. And you're like, what? Why are we taking this on? This is not our issue, right? Like, or not our like doesn't really fall under our portfolio of a city. Like when we think about our highways. Correct. Yeah. The gardener. Exactly. The gardener, the DVP, uh, Toronto community housing. It used to be Ontario housing. It was downloaded onto the city. There are lots of things that have been downloaded onto the city. Uh, and these are not things that I think we envisioned a property tax base to pay for. Right. Uh, property taxes weren't intended to pay for social supports. They were intended to pay for roads and community centers and parks and those, those types of city services, not the social and health related ones. So I think there is an important conversation to be had around this. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying that because I do think people like the, it gets confusing. Like if you're not following all the politics and understanding the different levels of government, well, the city like why are people talking about toll roads what like and i think that was a conversation that had come up because people are like most of the people are using the gardener which isn't really a city infrastructure but has been downloaded to the city and responsible for the maintenance of most people are using that are coming from outside of toronto so how do we be mindful of the the cost to the, the torontonians who live here and so I think, you know, is that going to become something that gets revisited with regards to tolls? So one of the things we have happening with the province right now through Bill 23, um, and Bill 23 was changing development charges, and our very smart city staff uh, pointed out that this was going to cost the city about $200 million a year. And Mayor Tory pointed this out to the, pro to the province who said, you know, we'll keep you whole, but we want to audit your books and we want proof that this is what's going to cost you. So we are going through an audit right now with the province. Okay. That audit is looking at uh, what our, our um, reserves are, our reserves funds are, what they say that they're supposed to pay for, um, what the losses will be for development charges. I have been trying to, as a next phase, have an audit that looks at what we pay for versus what they should be paying for. So That's I've been so very smart. vocal to say <laughs> exactly what you were pointing out there. You know, there are things the city of Toronto is paying for right now that should be uploaded back to the province. And that is also another way to help with our books in addition to potentially revenue tools or a new fiscal framework, which is really where I think we need to go. Well, I'm so glad you're at the helm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, you know, and I, I really appreciate you taking the time to share this because I think so many people just conflate, like, who's responsible for what? What do people do? What do councillors do? What is a mayor, like, what is, what's the role of a mayor? What, what's within their powers? Because super mayor powers, oh, sounds like they're a superhero. What, like, people don't, not that people don't care, but it's just complicated and having you to be able to say, Da, 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 this is what it is. It's so helpful. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, I just wanted, like, I think I love Toronto and I'm very passionate about Toronto and I'm a bit of a history nerd and all of that stuff. So I, I, I love following that. So I want us to talk about like the good, you know, like where can, like, we've got a lot of things we have to do. And I think that's just good housekeeping. That's good management. That's building, continuing to build the great city that Toronto is what do you love about the city? The good is the people. It's yeah. just absolute amazing people that live in the city of Toronto doing amazing things. We are the economic engine of Canada because of the ideas that Toronto residents have that it, they have put into action. And our motto at the city is diversity, our strength. 
And it truly is. In this current role I'm in, I've been able to travel across the city and meet with all kinds of different stakeholders that I never would have met with before yeah. and to hear their stories and hear about the great things they are doing both to uh, stimulate our economy, but also just to take care of people uh, is really, really wonderful and heartwarming. So true. I mean, you know, you go to your neighbor, ask for, you know, you got a, you got a cup of sugar, you know, I totally think that's, that's, that's so wonderful. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you was, as we bring this to kind of a close is, what's your favorite quote so, or guiding principle? I think it's probably um, from a song. Sure. Uh, so an good. older song, <laughs> uh, but I love the line in You Choose One that we get to carry each other. And I like that they say we get, not we have to or we must, because really it is um, an honor to take care of each other. Yeah. And it is a privilege to take care of each other. It's a privilege to grow old with somebody. Uh, and so I just always think that's such a wonderful line that it, it's it we get, not we have to or we must uh, or we can, but like we get to because it's, it's an honor. It is certainly an honor to serve in so many capacities. And you are wearing t -t 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 multiple hats, but you are doing such a great job. Like, I was just like, oh my goodness, what does that mean for her life? <laughs> you know, like, you know, you're not, you sign up to be a counselor and, and you're like, okay. And then you have all these added responsibilities and you, you rise to that challenge, but you have done such a wonderful job. You were so lucky to have you as our deputy mayor, acting mayor. I know that's not the official title, but you are so great. And I thank you so much for sharing, um, for caring. Oh my gosh. Now I'm like just rhyming. So thank you. Oh, thank you. It's been, uh, it's been, it's been wonderful. Um, you know, I really do try to have fun with whatever I'm doing. Uh, so, and, and that's here as well. Uh, we work hard, but we enjoy what we're doing. I take my job seriously, but I try not to take myself seriously so that it makes it uh, a very enjoyable experience. Oh, no. I, but that's what makes it awesome. Like, you're here because you want to be here, right? And you want to take care of others. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the tea. Pleasure. That was awesome. Okay. You're so awesome. Of Thank course. You. How can it not be?